Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell with the Korea IT Times, and I'm here with Liera Keith and Melinda Hughes, two activists, longtime activists. Uh, just they were just involved in an action, and that we're going to talk about. But first of all, Liera is the author of Bright Green Lies, the recent book out, and also another one that I've actually read and praised called The Vegetarian Myth, which I called a tour de force. Uh, looking at uh, farming and the mining of the soils. Uh, Melinda is an activist with Women's Declaration International, 40 years of experience. As, as I said, when I've talked to you all before, that I uh, feel like I'm with experienced people who know what is going on out there. And we also have uh, another visitor. So who is visiting with us here? I have five dogs. This is one. Oh, we have five. Five new visitors. Five. <laughs> um, and this is one. His name is Duke, and he's the biggest one. He weighs 160 pounds. He, so he's he a, came over and wanted to get get petted. He, they're all great Pyrenees dogs, so they're all really big dogs. But this yeah. guy's enormous. He's the size of a Shetland pony. Yeah, the can, can we see him again? So I mean, we might as well interview him. Good lord, he's a big guy. He's huge. Yeah. It's like the bears at Derek's house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, guess they come to your house too, huh? comment I get in public is, that's not a dog, that's a polar bear. Who are you fooling? That's so, right. Yeah. Well, I want to first, um, let's look at historical background. I want to ask you, Lier, about uh, the feminist waves uh, that you and I, have, of course, discussed in the past and emailed about and, you know, so forth and so on. But can you tell, can you tell us, first of all, what are the feminist waves that came about and I'm talking about, say, with uh, De Beauvoir and uh, Fisher and then on up into today. Because today what we hear about is this uh, third wave feminism, which doesn't look anything like what an actual feminism would be, right. according to you. Yeah. Please. Well, the very first wave, um, so-called, would be the suffrage movement. Um, you know, back around the turn of the 19th century. They It started in about 1850. Um, it was a long, long, long process of women trying to win the vote in, you know, around the world, really. But I would say the center of it was really in the United Kingdom and England. Um, very, very committed women there. And they tried for an entire generation to use, you know, basic techniques of, like, persuasion and just trying to be rational and reasonable and, you know, making their, their claims to full human and, and civic rights uh, just known to the public. And they didn't really get anywhere. So finally, Emmeline Pankhurst, who was one of the, the leaders of the movement, and you have to understand that in her family, I mean, it, it, she had already been involved in, um, you know, all the sort of going social issues of the day. So there was this whole group of people, you know, going back two, three generations who were in abolition movement, trying to stop slavery, uh, the labor movement, you know, trying to, uh, industrialization had been such hell for common people. And you know, people were working 12, 14 hours a day. There were no child labor laws. You know, tiny little children were working in factories. Um, horrible stuff like this. So uh, the labor movement was, you know, a going thing. Um, and, of, and, of course, feminism. So trying to win women the vote. So this had been going on a long time already at that point. And there comes this moment in Emily's life where she realizes that um, we're just not getting anywhere. You know, we can keep doing the same things over and over again. We've given this decades. And men just are not going to give us what we want. So we're going to have to force the issue. And part of what she realized was that, you know, she had a lot of women who had dedicated their lives to this already. And they had a lot of political experience, but they were tired <laughs> and they were worn out and they didn't have hope. And they didn't have that, um, you know, what the youth always bring to movements, which is, you know, a kind of fearlessness, you know, a real courage and that fire that you have when you're young that fades as we age. I mean, let's get real. You don't have the same kind of energy when you're 50 as when you're 18. And she realized that this movement was going to have to bring the fire of the young and their commitment and their, you know, almost like insane levels of belief that they could get this done. She saw it in her own daughter. So we're like, oh, like well, there's this great moment where in, in, um, in Christabel's, her, her, her oldest daughter, Christabel has this great quote in one of her uh, journals about how, you know, it's, she even says to her mom when she's like 12 years old, you women have been trying so long to get the vote, uh, but I intend to do it. And her mother was like, you know, is there a difference between trying to get the vote and actually winning the vote? And she's like, we have to put this together. We need to put together the political experience uh, that, that we've earned with this kind of fiery passion of the young 
and she did that. And so what she created was the WSTU, is the Women's Social and Political Union, and they were not connected to any political party. In fact, they were opposed to that in any way. Whoever was running, they were going to target. So some of their main things were they would go to any place where there was a, a you know a public meeting about the next election or whoever was you know running in the election. And they would just disrupt the meeting and they would scream votes for women and do a banner drop and then get arrested. Um, and they intended to get arrested because one of their main goals, one of their main strategies was doing this kind of civil disobedience, which at that point, nobody quite was calling it that, but that's what they were doing. They were on purpose confronting power so that the state would have to intervene. Um, and then they started doing hunger strikes in prison, claiming that they were political prisoners because they had literally no civil rights. So... Yes, they were political prisoners. Uh, that was very that was very wise of them to understand exactly what was at stake. And then they just kept upping the ante because they refused to stop doing hunger strikes, and then they were forced fed. And a few hundred women volunteered repeatedly to go in and be tortured, essentially. So this was male violence organized by the state. This is exactly what they showed. And so they, when you do these kinds of militant actions, you know, when you are the people who decide that you're going to now increase the pressure that you're putting on power, um, it's always controversial. There's not a single movement I've ever looked at, read about, or seen in person where this does not happen, where the movement has to deal with you now because you've pushed the issue. And you will get called stupid and foolish and, oh, you're going to get people killed. And it's true. People die sometimes in these movements. Power this is what power does, and freedom isn't free. It's never free. There are always people who have to risk their lives. And, you know, horribly, sadly, tragically, you know, in hindsight, we call these people heroes, but people do die. You know, there were people who died in the civil rights movement. There were people who died in the anti-war movement, um, in, you know, the anti-Vietnam movement. So, there were people who died to try to get freedom for the Eastern Bloc countries. Most of those were one using nonviolence, but there were some... There were some deaths, and then there were two countries that, that didn't win by nonviolence, and there was some pretty horrible things that happened. But this is, yeah, okay. you know, if you're going to confront power, you have to realize it's dangerous. Um, right. Non so nonviolence means, doesn't mean that they're not going to come at you. Well, exactly. <laughs> this is what people don't understand. You're not doing this to stay safe. Right. You're not doing this because the other side will then behave. You're doing it exactly the opposite to show their violence because yeah. they will come at you. Right. Any system that is characterized by hierarchy is backed up by violence. The right. violence is always there on a daily level, and all you're doing is making it really obvious to the public. And Gene Sharp, who's the main theorist of non nonviolent action, he died a few years ago, but his you have to read his work if you're any kind of political yes. activist. He's, he's absolutely an amazing human being. And he's the one who really kind of chalks this out for us. You know, he, he did extensive research, you know, hundreds of years of historical research about people using this technique. And he says it's, it's political jujitsu because you're taking the violence of the system, you're making it apparent to, to everyday people, and you're using it against them. So you're, you're turning their violence back on them. Um, but the way that it works is that you have to hold the nonviolent discipline because the violence can only come from one side to make it obvious to the average people. So it by doing this, you separate supporters from the regime, whatever regime, you know, you're up against. Um, it could be white supremacy, it could be a government, it could be a coup, it could be male supremacy, you name your thing. Um, that's, I'll call that the regime. So um, it, it separates just the supporters have to see, oh, wow, I didn't actually sign up for this. Um, you know, they're killing priests and nuns in the street. This is horrible. Um, so it can separate the people who actually support it. Um, a big way that it works is if you're dealing with a military coup or some kind of a dictator, you want the army on your side. You want the people with the guns to understand that they have way more in common with you than they will ever have with this horrible dictator. Um, and that particular technique is called fraternizing. Um, but it work, you know, it can work. And there's many examples in my lifetime of people doing this, of getting the soldiers who are, frankly, usually teenage boys with no real economic options, right? Mm -hmm. And the military is, you know, the, the regime in charge is asking them to open fire essentially on their parents and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And if you can rehumanize yourself to these young men, um, it can work where all of them say, we're actually not going to do this. 
And then the regime falls. And this is what happened in the Philippines when the, you know, they had the people power movement against Marcos. It took three days of standing in those streets, but they got it done. And not a single one of those young guys could open fire when they were told to do it. Riga um, Burke mentioned in Guatemala. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Did the same. They did the yeah. same thing. So, so women, of course, women and men are fighting in this movement to get uh, vote, vote for women, suffrage for women, right? Sure. Uh, Okay, so that's one. We we move through the 1950s. We move up into the 1970s. In the United States, the most advanced country in the world, women still cannot participate in uh, jury trials right. until 1975. Okay, right. can you take can you take us from there? And then I want to get to Melinda and the and the experience that you all had. Can you take us from there to now? Sure. I mean, yeah. 1975. I mean, finally, we move yeah. into. <laughs> The, the modern world. So in the 1960s, there's all this social ferment. So you have the anti-war movement, you have the civil rights movement, there's all kinds of things that are being questioned. Um, and, you know, they're trying to make a world that, that's got more justice in it, right? And there's, of course, always women are, are participants in these movements, peace movement, civil rights movement, you know, you, you name the movement that's about making a better world and women are always the, you know, the troops in the movement. Often the leadership will be men, but it's actually women doing most of the groundwork. And so you have this decade of this sort of, you know, rapid social change happening. And women are learning these, how to, first, the tools of political analysis, mm -hmm. and second of all, how to organize. So and a lot of them are very young. Um, some of them are more long-term, but, you know, you've got people in their late teens, early 20s who are joining up because it's been a very exciting time to be a young person, and they're trying to make this better world. Um, and then all of a sudden, women take these tools <laughs> that they've learned in these political movements, and they realize that if they analyze their own lives, we've got a problem, Houston. So this is the beginning of what's called the second wave. And there's this explosion across the culture where women take these tools learned on the left about power, about how to analyze power, about oppression, about subordination, about what these things mean, and how they might affect one, um, and they apply it to their own lives. And the main tool was called consciousness raising. And what it meant was women sitting in small groups and talking about the details of their lives and realizing there are patterns. And these patterns are political. And all of a sudden, women have an opportunity to think the thought, oh, this didn't happen to me because my name is Susan and I play the violin and I'm just an individual floating through the universe. It happened to me because I'm a woman. These things happen to me because I have a female body and this is what men do to women. They extract us for resources. Um, they exploit us emotionally. Um, then you get into all the things about sexual violence, the ways that, that men violate women for sexual pleasure. Um, and all of this is called normal. It's called natural. It's supposed to be, you know, brought down by God or created by evolution. So, you know, depending on whether you're right wing or left wing, you're going to hear a slightly different story. But it always means that men are on top, women are on the bottom. And we exist to provide these things for men. And all of a sudden, women realize, and that's just the slogan, the personal is political. And what they meant was, all of these personal details that I just thought were sort of random bad things that might happen to me, actually all women live under this. And right. it's not just personal. It's, these it's are actually, systemic. These it's are systemic. Political, it's the, yes, these are political institutions that are creating this, and it doesn't have to be this way. So... Uh, this is the second wave, and there's this, like I said, an explosion across the culture, and women start demanding changes, changes in the men around them, changes in the, you know, the, the social story that we're all telling, and especially changes in the law. So my mother couldn't get a credit card in her own name when she divorced my dad in 1976. But women had to fight that in court to get those laws changed, um, and then down to really gruesome things like, you know, rape shield laws that a woman's past sexual history could be used against her. And if you'd ever had sex with anyone ever, you were not considered rapeable. Uh, you were public property. Um, that had to change so that it didn't matter whether you had, you didn't want to have sex with that man at that moment. It's rape. So all of that had to change. Sexual harassment law, that had to be argued before the Supreme Court. Catherine McKinnon did that. She got that done saying, this is a power relation between, um, you know, employers and employees or uh, teachers and students or doctors and patients. This, this is a boundary that cannot be violated without great harm being done. 
because the person in the subordinate position can't say no without right. there being terrible consequences. So this is a form of, of, of you know, it's sexual harassment, and it's, um, it's a violation of people's civil rights. Um, we now have sexual harassment law, but that wasn't true in the 70s. That had to be argued before the Supreme Court. So bit by bit, women tried to knock every brick out of that barricade of sexual terrorism. And we got some good things done. You know, like my mom went to consciousness raising, and that's why I'm a feminist. You know, like I really got a great, I had a great political education uh, growing up with my mom. And then, you know, all of my time in the 80s, you know, under the tutelage of women who had been through the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and then come through this, uh, you know, the beginning of second wave feminism. And I was always the youngest one in the room. Um, and it was great because these are women who were hardened activists and had amazing political analyses. I just, it was such a great time because like you could sit down and, you know, pick a room anywhere at, at whatever meeting. And if you were like, I don't really understand capitalism. What's wrong? There was always somebody in the room who could like give you like, in five minutes would explain exactly what was going on here. Like, oh, thank you so much. Like, you pick the issue, and somebody in that room could explain to you what was the problem, and, you know, you'd walk away knowing, like, okay, I get this now. Um, and you could take it anywhere. So uh, these were the women who, like, trained me up to be who I am, and it was an amazing thing, and then it all fell apart. So all of the different social movements that were happening in the Western world were sort of under the same uh, pressures, Right. And, and they fractured and they splintered and I, they're not here anymore. Um, right. They've become something well, totally different. Mir, so, so, what I hear. OK, first of all, I hear there was there was this background cultural violence in place, right. so much so that men and, and women couldn't see can even see it because it's right. in the actual relationships. That, that's one thing. Finally, women with the assistance of you know, everybody working together, but women broke out of this thing, build this foundation. I mean, these, to date, at least up until probably, but I guess between say the seventies when you're talking about and, and now, you simply cannot touch a woman on, un, un, what is it, uninvitedly, or what are it, you know, it's sexual harassment. This is in the law, codified, you can go to jail, felony, you know, so of course we have a president who just talks about grabbing women whenever he wants. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, during this time, there was this granite foundation codified into law that broke through all of that. And so I want to move to Melinda. And we we had this conversation in the past, Melinda. What happened? Uh, you you talked about uh, last time when we were talking that you started to see this break down, like like Lear said, it broke down. What started to happen, say, maybe in the, you know, 2005, 2010 range? Is, am, am I right, Lear? Or is this about the time that... The, you know, the, the roots of this were laid, I would say, in the late eight, in mid, mid to late 80s. Okay. But I think it didn't really come to people's consciousness until much later. Because all of a sudden it looks like, what? Everything's gone crazy. And it's like, this has been going on, honestly, for a long time. But it was inside like the tempest in a teapot kind of thing. It was like always in these little subgroups. And if you weren't part of this sort of subculture, you wouldn't have seen it. It wasn't affecting normal people doing normal things in kind of the normal world. Um, and I never thought it would break out to this extent, but it has. And now, of course, they grabbed power everywhere. So I'll turn it back to Melinda. Yeah, so I, again, I'm not the scholar. Um, I'm So I, I, I'm going to kind of I talk about things just from my uh, my perspective as a lifelong left leftist and uh, and what things looked like and I think it it's so important that we we won women won so much in the 70s we didn't get the ERA and they even did hunger strikes hearkening back to you know the days of the suffrage uh, movement but but we we got so much like I I wanted to say that um, women just 10 years older than me. I worked with a woman who was uh, the first ar female architect in her firm in the in the mid 1970s, and I mean they had horrible things. People left porn on her desk, right? They left jock straps hanging over her um, cubicle. And by the time I'm working in an office in the mid 1980s, like one daring guy brings a Playboy in, and it's like pretty much only the creepiest of men even go near him because it's like things have changed really pretty quickly. So. Um, 
one thing I'm thinking of when I'm saying all of that is that that now that is reversing too, because now we're seeing, you know, essentially porn in schools, right? Like here, uh, again, I, I feel like, you know, here I am, you know, being an adult in the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s in workplaces where, you know, men feel like, you know, you certainly can't hit a woman on the butt and you certainly can't even ask her anything about her sex life. And now we're like in elementary school trying to get kids to identify their sexuality and something. So even though these laws are all in place and this is a big part of what's going on now, these laws still exist, but people are violating them in the name of this, this other thing. So um, yeah, we moved through last time a little bit of third wave feminism and, you know, Susan Faludi is the big kind of, I think one of the outstanding experts on, on how the backlash happened and feminism became rebranded and, you know, being sexy was now feminist. And, um, and it seemed like really quickly women just now, just 10 or 15 years younger than me, they take everything that was built for granted in a way that I think Lier and I were still we're old enough to remember that our moms couldn't have credit cards and that and that women couldn't get uh, more than $10 back from a check without their husband's approval when they went into the grocery store. This is all stuff that was still going on when we were little kids, you know. So um, I think that has, um, we've, we've we moved through this period of, um, you know, which was very, you know, it was good for men and it was good for capitalism to sell women, you know, sexy underwear and that kind of stuff. We moved back into that, third wave kind of this is you know all of these things that men want us to do are actually empowering for women as it turns out and so you know that that was what kind of third wave feminism i think in a nutshell was um i also wanted to say um because i grew up in the san francisco bay area my parents were hippies so the first like transgender women i met and people you know, they call, they'll say all kinds of things to you, like, oh, you've never met them. It's like, oh, honey, no, I'm, you know, I'm from the Bay Area. I met these people when I was 19, you know. I mean, I met them long before anybody, you know, now who is arguing for this stuff, you know, most of them, you know, ever met these people. And we did, to get to your question about how this all happened, um, I thought they were an extension of gay. You know, I think that's what a lot of people thought. And they were so marginal and so weird and so pathetic, you know, like as a woman, I just, I felt really, you know, sad for them. And I wanted to, you know, if they want to put on a dress, you know, okay, sure, hon, you know, nobody, nobody really believes you're a woman, but you're obviously so disturbed, you know, they really invoke this, this pity, you know, in people. And I think they rode that for a long time and like Lear alluded to, um, there were lots of people who saw this coming back in the 70s and 80s, and they started to do things like take over Mitch Fest. I didn't know any of that. You know, I was out here just being a general good person lefty thinking, you know, well, the marginalized, you know, you always have to support the marginalized, right? The marginalized always have to be elevated or at least supported because they're marginal, not necessarily. The presumption on, I think, on the left is that people are marginal not because they are doing anything destructive and not because they're antisocial, but because they are oppressed. It's the only lens through which we, you know, kind of learned how to see marginalization. Um, and then that becomes, so, so then, you know, obviously that creates a hole you can drive a truck through because, you know, pedophiles are also marginalized, right? People with, um, you know, with horrible behavior towards others are marginalized, but, when when marginalization equals oppression, which is kind of the cultural left right. message, I feel like I I got for many years, you know, you 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 elevate those people, and the sociopaths learn to ride that. And I'm not saying that all people who claim to be the opposite sex are sociopaths. I don't believe that at all. But there's a there's an element of the movement that is that. Hold on just a second, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> We can go ahead and we can continue, Lear, because I what I hear uh, in this in this third wave is the the trans issue, and also I've seen where you have said uh, or you wrote or you said in public that uh, uh, prostitution all of a sudden became like uh, something okay to do, something good, and so maybe we can get into all of these kind of 
politics as we go along. So anyway, back back to the trends. Sorry issue. about that. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. So it just they, these things happened, and they and they they merge. And I guess because I'm not an academic, I can't trace exactly how it all happened. But it it merges with third wave feminism, and and the aesthetic of the third wavers, you know, becomes part of this. You know, there's so so obviously men who dress like women have been a big part of prostitution for a very, 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 very long time. And when you have prostitution as empowerment and these people right. are involved in prostitution, it all kind of merges together to elevate, you know, what they're going to call sex work and and lots of things that are completely antithetical to feminism, you know, and all of these factors combine, I think, to get us into the early 2000s where suddenly um, suddenly it, it's really not okay to suggest, you know, or in the mid, you know, the two, the 20 teens, it's suddenly not okay on the cultural left at all to suggest that men who dress in women's clothing are not women, right? I mean, the, I had my peak trans moment, like a lot of women, uh, when Bruce Jenner was on the cover of Vanity Fair. And I, I, I wasn't even objecting to him calling himself a woman. I was just objecting to how how objectified he looked. <laughs> you know, like I was, I would have been more okay if he had just worn a you know a smart business suit or something. You know, and I would have thought, oh, okay, well, you know, he's got this gender identity. But, but the fact that it was so hypersexualized that the sixty year old nice. man was doing this hypersexualized thing that that was sort of the penny dropping for me. And yeah. I just brought it up gingerly with a with a transgender person who I was working with on face. You know, I, I I was Facebook friends with this person, and I said, "Well, I just wish you know she had chosen a less objectifying kind of presentation of womanhood." That's all I said, and the people came out of the woodwork to berate me and tell me that I was victim blaming, a rich white guy, right? Like I'm victim blaming Bruce Jenner for wearing panties on Vanity Fair. Um, and it was it was a real shock to me because, you know, while I had seen the third wave feminism, I just, I and I had, you know, worked with this transgender guy who was pretty narcissistic and weird. I, you know, I just attributed it to him being a, a unique individual and I, I had no idea that this movement, like I keep saying, Lier was there aware of it the whole time. I'm just sort of a you know naive leftist who's thinking, oh, everything's good now, you know, like trans people are being accepted and all of that stuff. And it, it just all analysis that I had ever had, they were throwing back in my face like it was privilege, you know, like it, it's just, you know, oh, you're a woman, so you don't have to, you know, prove that you're a woman. And I'm like, <laughs> It just didn't make any sense to me. And so, yeah, I think uh, these things, these strands were all kind of going on in the 90s and the early 2000s. Some people knew they were, a lot of us didn't. And then for a lot of us, it just hit us like a ton of bricks. The reason I'm asking so many questions for those listening is so that I'm trying to build up the story to the actual event where you all were involved in this kind of conflict. But before we get to that, uh, what I, what I was talking with Lear about when you came back there and what, what you mentioned is that uh, one thing is that uh, prostitution becomes women's empowerment. In, in my opinion, most all prostitution is, is rape. Uh, my opinion, I said it publicly and that's what it is. Now, it is. Rape for can, money, that's what it is. Exactly. It doesn't, just because we, all, we give a, a monetary exchange in the market doesn't end the uh, whatever has uh, historically happened or what's going on at the time. And, and I also, I have called uh, uh, the tourist areas of the world where this happens, I call those comfort houses, rape centers of the global economy. Uh, can, you, can you respond to my opinions on this subject, Lier? Well, you're exactly right. And I have no idea why the left has decided that Prostitution is some kind of wonderful, empowering activity for anyone um, when it is so obvious that it is the women with the least possible choices who end up having to do this. Um, and their rates of post-traumatic stress equal or surpass 
the post-traumatic stress rates of men who have been on the front lines of battle. So this is a war, and we are looking at war victims. Um, and it's a war waged on the bodies of women by men. Um, and everything that we know about prostitution um, backs that up. Um, they have certainly done research asking men why they use women this way, and the answer is always the same, that they enjoy having power over a woman because they want to dehumanize her and hurt her, and it gives them a sexual thrill to do that. So they are very upfront about why they want to do it. Um, I don't know why there's a group of women who want to defend these men um, and defend this, this uh, you know, kind of economy. I, I just, I have no idea why what is happening to those women is so invisible as a, as a kind of harm when it, it should just be absolutely obvious to anyone that has right. to do that uh, would be a, a terrible, terrible trauma day after day. And the fact that, you know, the average age now of induction into this industry, I think it's 11. It used to be 14, but of Gosh. course it's dropped and dropped and dropped. And so, of course, it's in the it, news now with this uh, Epstein thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, and, and what, what I'm getting at is, is, is most all prostitution, there are going to be people listening that are going to challenge us and say, well, you know, well, well certainly there, yeah, I recognize that maybe there are discreet negotiations that go on where people are freely doing this. That we're not talking about that. We're talking about this kind of mainstream prostitution that, that they're saying is empowering women. And the next one I wanted to get to is that you said rightly that what's going on is the use of this basis of feminism that was fought for by women for so long, it's being used to erase women. And so I want to ask Lier that question. And then Melinda, I want to move into uh, the organizing for the action at the library. Yeah. I, I mean, I ultimately think it's a position of terrible despair that women have actually engaged enough with the situation of women you know, globally, and realize that it's huge and it's horrible, and that there's it's bottomless. Like, the amount of hatred that some men have for women, you will never find a bottom. You know, when they are murdering women, torturing women, um, and filming it, you know, selling the film, um, and there's, there's, just, there's no end to it. Um, and that is, like, spiritually, it's, it's a horrible moment in one's life when you realize that that level of sadism exists and that you, you're never going to reach the end of it. It's like you can keep trying to find the next horrible thing. All right, I've absorbed that. I can handle it. We can do something about it. And then there's one more. And then there's one more. And I think for a lot of human beings, they just reach overload. Um, and so they have to make up a whole new narrative just in order to handle it emotionally. And I, so I just think this is a position of tremendous despair, both spiritually and politically, that we're never going to change you know, the, this level of hatred that, that so many men have to women, and therefore we're just going to tell a different story about it. And that story is that, oh, women aren't victims, they're participants, and, you know, we're all just free beings who can make these decisions and blah, blah. Um, and I just want to say really clearly that prostitution is not about women's choices. It's about men's choices. It would not exist if men did not have money and women were poor. The moment you take those two things out, it's gone. And you can look at Iceland as a country to see this exact thing happened. In 2011, they, um, they made uh, strip clubs illegal in Iceland. Because when you look at Iceland, and this is a little tiny country, everybody knows everybody, um, and they have really great social um, support everywhere. Um, nobody lives in poverty in Iceland. And there's literally not a single uh, native-born Icelandic woman who was working in those sex clubs, not one. Every last woman in those clubs was, was imported from Northern Africa. So you go to the most desperate places in the world and you find women who don't want to die and probably have children or parents they have to support. Yeah, you can make human beings have to degrade themselves like that. But it was so clear in Iceland. And the, yeah, the government had to come around and say, with a lot of pressure from good feminists, you know, they had a feminist president for a while. And they, it was just so obvious. It was like, yeah, okay, this is who's actually in this. Uh, and they made it illegal. And uh, there's this great quote from the president when she said, men are just going to have to accept that women are no longer for sale in Iceland. So there are no more strip clubs in Iceland. Um, so that's it right there. Like that's the, the best little laboratory you could ever want. And it was really, really clear. When women had enough money uh, to actually survive, uh, nobody was willing to do this. Because it's not fun at all. It's actually quite traumatizing to have to do this. So um, anyway, I think that it's just a position of great despair that, that women, you know, make very complicated narratives to explain away 
um, the level of sadism and hatred that they just don't want to face. Um, I mean, the the alternative is, all right, we have to face it. It means you, you are going to bear a burden of, of knowing that, that knowledge should be about liberation. And in some cases, it just isn't. We have to know horrible things about the world. Um, but if you can bear up under it, you can make the world a better place. You know, there's the Nordic model, which has been very successful everywhere it's been tried. And, you know, just go over it very briefly, but this is what they did in Sweden. Um, and that's, that's where it started. So sometimes it's called the Swedish model. But um, you recognize that the people who are being prostituted, um, whether it's men, whether it's women, whether it's children, that they're the victims in this and they need help. They need help getting out. They're going to need victim services when they get out. And then they're going to need help establishing a better life. So if you give them support, they will leave in droves. When you ask them around the world, that's what they say. 96% of people, mostly women in prostitution, will say, I want to get out. I have no way to realistically do that. Um, 96%. And the other 4%, frankly, are on too many drugs to know better. I mean, I just, I don't think those are people who could actually, you know, have, have anything, honestly, that's rational to say about their own lives because it's so awful. But 96%, I mean, overwhelming majority of people want to get out of this situation who are in it, which to me just isn't that everything you would want to know as somebody who cared about human beings. But anyway, they need help. The people who are doing the harm are the pimps and the johns, so the procurers and then the sex buyers. Um, and those people are criminalized. So those men are the ones that the police, that the state is allowed to go after and um, try to stop. So, um, so they criminalized yeah. criminalize that... Um that, that PowerPoint, I guess, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Melinda, moving into the issue of, of, of trans. Now, uh, you all were organizing an, an event that didn't even have anything to do with trans, but I want to just talk a little bit about the trans issue. So if I say uh, I want to be a, um, I, 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 I'm a woman, I'm going to join up in the women's boxing for the Olympics or something, and I, I, you know, I weigh 100 and, uh, you know, 75 pounds and muscle, and I go up against somebody that's my age, weight, whatever they do, you know, however they do this thing. Uh, why can't I say I'm a woman and, and have this accepted by the Global Olympic Committee, the UN, and everything else, which it looks like they are, but, yeah. So, I mean, the answer is just what, why do we ever separate sports by sex, then, if, if, I mean, they think it's pretty self-apparent. Um, and it's really challenging as a feminist to have people throw in your face, well, you guys were the ones who said that men and women were the same. It's like, no, no, we, we, we never said that. We never said that there were no differences between men and women. There are differences between women, men and women, which is why women fought to have equal funding and participation in sports. And that meant the creation of women's teams because if you're just going to pick the best basketball players regardless of sex we know what sex the basketball team is going to be so to make it equal we have women's sports so that we can have fair competition and um yeah we do not play sports with our gender identities we play sports with our bodies um so it's you know it and and mediocre male athletes are not female athletes. I mean, one of the things I always think is interesting is that is, while it's overwhelmingly unfair to women, it's also, you know, it's unfair to the guys who are ranked 10 through 450th when dude number 451 puts on a wig and then he suddenly, you know, gets, uh, you know, medals and scholarships and whatnot, you know, so it, it's, uh, it's, 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 I, it's hard to even believe we're having this conversation, I, right? Like, I was why just, shouldn't look, we? Melinda? I, I, was know, say I, know, the same. I know you're being I, hypothetical, but this is real. I mean, it really is. I can't believe people are saying, even even with the uh, one of the worst ones, right? Will Thomas. I've had these arguments with people. Well, she was a swimmer before, so why shouldn't she keep being a swimmer after she transitions? And it's like, wow, she was she. He was a uh, you know he was a media, middling swimmer. Um, for three solid years, NCAA, you know, he had, he only had one year left of his NCAA um, standing and he chose to, to go be on the women's uh, um, swim team and they just let him. And um, it's hard to imagine. If I can circle back for one more minute, because yes. I, I, you've made me really more, a little more interested in this question of the third wave feminism and the trans. 
and I and on a different day we'll talk about how you, how you can't even trust research anymore. But in my little flurry of reading all about this stuff, when after I had my peak trans moment, um, I remember reading a, more about um, prostitution and. Um, <clears throat> so part of the empowerment narrative is also being driven by trans. Now we can't even know who's male and who's female in research. But back in you know the 80s and 90s, when people were actually doing research on male prostitutes, um, the male attitude in prostitution of grown men, you know, and well, young men, uh, is typically a little bit less. Um, they don't experience it typically as brutally. I'm not saying they aren't brutalized too, um, but if you look at people like Janet Mock, one of the famous um, um, men who claims to be a woman, he writes enthusiastically about going into prostitution as a teenager. So, the, so part of the uh, empowerment narrative is actually driven by these these men claiming to be women. You know, he he you know he talks about being a prostitute for years and you know and uh, and saving. That's how he saved up money to get his gender surgery and whatnot. Um, so I just I do I don't want to let that go. That men and women do typically experience prostitution differently. And I'm not saying there aren't horribly victimized men in prostitution. I know that there are. Um, Children. But then they but then they call themselves women, and then it's like, look, these women feel it's empowering, and it and it helps to to solidify that empowerment uh, narrative. Exactly. There's um, I have here in my notes. Uh, how is it that ESPN, CNBC, and Democracy Now go for this? The air. I don't have any explanation for, for why. I it's so complete. I don't either. Every single person alive knows the difference between men and women. I mean, by the time you're five or six years old, you absolutely know that men are bigger and stronger, and they're the people to be afraid of. And that if you're lost in a crowd, you go to the mom. You look for a, a middle-aged woman with children, and you you figure she'll help you, and she likely will. Mm -hmm. If you're a lost child, you know who to go to. You're not going to strange men; they're too scary. Um, everybody can see the difference between men and women. Men are big and women are small. I don't, and I'm pretty tall, but like, you know, men are bigger. Um, I, mean, I think the there's average genetics, has there's endocrinology. Like, I mean, everything. The lung capacity, joint strength, muscle mass, the bone density, um, the size of the heart and the lungs. It's, it's just on every single and measure. And have children. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's those female I mean, beings, those special female beings, they can have children, you know, it's this, these, you know, we, we, I think I remember them. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, we used to have a word for them. Yeah, uh, right. That's yeah. right, yeah. I mean, this, I, uh, really, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone talking about this. Everybody you know, does. Really. When they when they have to understand how bad this is and that it's true, because we get treated like we're crazy. Like you go out to the normies and you try to explain it, they just don't believe you. And then they do a little bit of research or it hits their home and then, then they're just, Done. And then there's like these months of just where they're absolutely, they cannot believe how bad this is. Right, right. Um, and one of the women who has gone on to be an incredible activist, but her daughter was one of the swimmers that had to swim with um, Will Thomas. And her daughter was so traumatized by this experience because it's not just the swimming. You have to understand he was allowed in their locker room and they were told they had to go to these sessions week after week where the uh, college made them sit through essentially struggle sessions. And they were told, if you say anything bad about him, he's going to commit suicide and it will be your fault. You have to accept this man. Um, and the, the young That's women true. who had to go through this, they had nightmares week after week because they were being forced to be naked against their will in front of this man who literally paraded around the, the locker room with an erection, leering at them. And they were allowed to say nothing about it. So the mother of the, one of these swimmers has, is the one who created this a huge group now. It's called Icon, which fights for women's sports especially. Um, but you know, she was like, she kept thinking this can't be true. Like this can't, can't be true that like these colleges are making this happen to young women. Surely it's a mistake. And it's not like this is their policies now is that men who claim some special woman identity are allowed into the women's locker room and allowed into the competition. So we're not crazy. So that's like the first problem you have to get over is like, it really is bad. Um, and you, you want me to explain ESPN? I can't. These are people their whole lives was clearly cared about sports, how it is that they don't know the difference suddenly between male athletes and female athletes, I, 
they've got to know. Well, I mean, democracy I, now. I mean, we're, oh. democracy now is like one of the gold standards for human rights reporting. Except and for women, right? Yeah. Except for women. <laughs> Early I mean, wait a minute. Those are those female beings that have children. I remember this now. You remember I them somewhere? Continue yeah. Continue to tell myself. To these people who had children, I think. Yeah. Somehow, somehow I got here. I, you know, maybe I, you know, came from the stars or something. But I think I probably came from a female. Probably you were not found under a cabbage. The, <laughs> yeah. I, I I have to add some humor. I usually don't add humor to my discussions, but it, this is so far out there. Now let's talk about uh, brute facts that came at you. Uh, and what I mean by brute facts is like violence came right at you. You organized uh, an event related to just feminism. It had nothing to do with trans issues. Apparently, from what I understand or from what I interpret, and I'll get the story here, is they already knew your positions on trans issues, on uh, <coughs> second, third wave, and they came after you. Uh, Melinda, can you start off and just kind of tell, tell us what happened going into this, you know, getting into this situation? Yeah. Um, so I, just briefly, um, a little bit based on the, on the work that's being done in the UK with the Let Women Speak events, um, a group of us um, and, and, with, and with great I will say it's uh, funding and support from WDI USA, um, which I just want to be clear. I, I um, I'm no longer. I was a, a full time or a, a regular volunteer for the last year, and I'm kind of taking a break there. So I, I just to be clear about my my relationship to the organization, I'm no longer um, and you know have a official volunteer uh, role there. But um, but they they. You know, Kara and Lier and a number of us decided that last year uh, when uh, Dana Rivers, a man who murdered a lesbian couple and their adult son in Oakland, was um, about to be uh, uh, found guilty of murder and might be going to a women's prison, um, we decided to do our first um, protest like this. And we we got Lier because she, you know, she she's really the core you know, person with activist and uh, NVDA, nonviolent direct action experience. And um, we, had, a number of us had been to a few demonstrations where like women's hearts were in the right place, but we found them arguing with these guys and whatnot. We, we need some strategy. And we decided um, to give some speeches um, at the courthouse in Oakland. And sure enough, you know, we gave our speeches and um, we weren't sure any of them were gonna show up. We kind of publicized it a bit. And but they did. They, you know, a little while later, we were down with our sign, a sign that says "woman, adult, human, female," and um, and they came and uh, some Antifa-looking guys with face masks and bicycles and threw pies and eggs at at us and and actually rammed their bikes into us. And that was kind of the beginning of a year where we decided, you know, people need to see this. This is the whole point of what we're doing. People need to see that these guys are are, you know, they're violent. We're not just talking, this isn't abstract anymore. This is like, you can't even go out and say that a male serial, I mean, a triple murderer shouldn't be held in a women's prison without being physically attacked in broad daylight in one of the most liberal cities in the country. Um, so we started, we kind of spent the year doing a number of, of actions and and had, you know, varying degrees of success. I, we, I loved being in Florida, I have to say. Nobody attacked us in Florida. We were, <laughs> we were able to just give our speeches. Um, but then in New York City, they didn't have numbers to attack us, but they, they uh, disrupted us with noise and they tried to um, cover our signs up so that the passersby couldn't see them because... I'm one of the things that I love about being a, when I'm out doing whatever kinds of actions I've ever been involved in is how much you know normal people are on your side. In my experience in life, whether it was you know trying to stop nuclear weapons or whatever, normies, you know, people, average people on the street start honking their horns, and that's always the experience when we bring our signs out too. Women, adult, human, female, lesbian, you know, female, homosexual normal people see us and they're just like, hey, you know, so I, that is always, that's always really warms my heart. Um, we knew that Portland um, was going to be 
a challenge. We, you know, Portland's got quite the reputation now as being, um, you know, uh, an Antifa town, um, you know, the, um, you know, the place where these, you know, they, they captured the city, you know, a few years ago during the, the summer of riots and, um, and it's never really recovered and everybody, you know, I mean, we're both in the Northwest, so we can, you know, we've, we've had this, we, you know, we know a lot of people in and around Portland, but we decided we were going to do this and, and go to a public library because still in the United States, public libraries are mandated to be, you know, viewpoint neutral and who they rent rooms to. So we actually rented a room and we decided let, let's not talk anything about transgender or gender ideology. There are still other feminist issues and male violence is one of them. So we're gonna talk about male violence and all of our speeches are gonna be about male violence. And um, we got the worst of the male violence that we had had in the entire uh, year. And um, and it was, uh, it was um, I, you know, I'm still sort of reeling from it. They, it was, it was very elaborate what they did. They, they were able to, um, infiltrate some of our um, planning meetings, um, find out where we had rented an Airbnb. Um, they came the night before our event, they slashed tires. There was a credible gun threat. Somebody had told his therapist that he was gonna bring a gun and use it. And that therapist alerted the authorities um, and alerted the library. Um, so we, the women woke up in this rented house in the morning with tire slash. So like we were sitting ducks in the house that we had rented. You know, this is, this is, mm -hmm. this is pretty terrifying, right? You know, like they know where we are and they know we can't get away except on foot. And they're letting us know this. And um, the women called Portland emergency. This was a non-emergency thing, even though we tried to explain like, look, it's not just an, a one-off event. Um, right around the time people were figuring out that the tires were slashed, um, we got a call from the library saying it had been vandalized the night before. The library where we're going to speak um, had been vandalized, spray painted, broken windows. I don't know if they got in and trashed the place. Um, I can't remember that, Leah. You'll you can fill in the details on that. So what, um, what you're but, describing is a, the, an escalation of, of threat, right? So they'll start giving you little threats. A little bit more. Okay, so it's escalating. I've got yeah. a list here of, of all kinds of things. Broken hands, blinded, beaten. What happened? Yeah, so we, um, to the much to the credit of the library staff and security, they said they still wanted us to um, rent the room. There seemed to be a real commitment, at least initially, on like to let us get in and do the do our speeches, do our, you know, and some women were coming, um, you know, uh, some women were coming locally. Um, we tried our very best to let people know that, you know, that there's, that there were, you know, there's certainly the possibility, there was definitely going to be protest and there was certainly the possibility that these men would get violent. Um, so we, we, um, they said, let us, let us sweep up the glass, literally, and we're closing the main part of the library, but we're still going to let you hold your event like that. So, I mean, kudos to them for doing that. Um, and then we finally got the call and we headed over there and we had rented vans. We've done this enough now. I mean, in San Francisco, the cops came out and set up a barricade, but if that, if, if not for the cops setting up a barricade, we would have faced um, some brutality there, um, and uh, and and we had learned from this the San Francisco experience that what that you know we could rent a van and all pile in and leave at the same time you know and so we 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 had fortunately because our tires were slashed um, we had already planned to rent vans and you know and show up. And we got a call while we were in the van from the librarian and the head of security for Multnomah. Um, county libraries and um, they came and met with us in the van. It was kind of cloak and dagger. You know, they um, they said, look, um, we really want you to come in, but our, our library staff have already been assaulted this morning. These guys, there's a, there's 30 of them at least swarming the library. They don't know what entrance you're going to come in. So they're walking around and around. We had to, we had to physically pull one of our library staff into the library this morning. So, 
Um, and we said, well, you know, in other cities, the cops come, you know, <laughs> and um, and they said, well, yeah, there was one cop car and that they know the cops came by and they said um, that just seemed to rile up the crowd, the Antifa crowd. Um, so they left. So, so we're, um, we're so we're, we're talking about recently, not Germany. And we're 19, talking November of 2023. Not Berlin, 1934. Not Johannesburg, 1980s. No. We're talking about like just a few months ago. Yeah, this is Portland, Oregon, November, late November, 2020. And you're being stalked. It's just this, just you know. You're being stalked. What by, did you say? You're being stalked by a mob. You're being stalked, threatened. Yes. And so what? And they're what doing happened? actual property damage. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're going hands-on county employees. And somehow that didn't get the cops out, which really, um, again, I don't, we're not like trying to lean heavily on the cops. Sometimes we even say, you know, let's, let's, let's show the world what these guys are doing. And the cops intervene, th you know, cause that's their job. And then, um, you know, I'm grateful that cops do, you know, their job that way. Um, but so we weren't trying to call the cops, but I was pretty surprised that they could go hands on and they could smash up a library and go hands on Multnomah County employees and the cops didn't come down and shut it down. Like, you know, that's again, my experience of being on the left, as we were talking about earlier, is you do anything like that. The cops, <clears throat> they show up and they send the activists packing. That is what happens. You know, that's what used to happen. Um, when I was, you know, an activist on on the left, but um, these guys are showing up. They're swarming the library. The 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 uh, they've come and ask us, what do we want to do? And then they also describe there are people with kids out there. There's a cafe next door. People are scared. There's a senior living center above the library, you know, and there are people who are showing up and they don't know the library's co closed, so they're just. They're coming here and these these guys are swarming. Um, and they even said, you know, we don't want to ask you to to not do your event. But, you know, they were basically saying, would you consider not going? And um, we made a snap decision um, and we can all, you know, we can question whether or not we should have gone into the library or not. But we we did want to consider all of the, you know, the normal people out there that weren't part of this, you know, this wasn't their beef. They were just trying to go to the library and we didn't want them and the senior citizens in the in the building next door or up, up above the library, you know, harmed. So we said, OK, we still want to do our action. We still want to bring our banner. We still want to do our speeches. Um, let's just, let's get out of the van. Let's march to a, a busy corner where there's foot traffic. Again, you know, it's always, people are always on our side when they see our message. Um, and so we got, we walked to a corner that was about a block and a half away from the library. It was pretty close. Um, and we, we just decided to start, um, um, doing our speeches, our speeches about male violence. And um, if, if people have a chance to look at, I think some of them are recorded and are on um, the WDI USA uh, Twitter account. Um, some of the women did uh, really amazing, well-researched, beautiful talks on different aspects of male violence. Um, one woman, Irene Lawrence, did incredible talk on what goes on in prisons. It's uh, it, was, it was, there were just some wonderful, great, 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 feminist talks about male violence, but nobody got to hear, hear him that day because um, pretty quickly, you know, within a few minutes, um, I was out recording, I was kind of in front. So I was just, I was, that was my role was to record all the talks and um, they, they figured it out. You know, they, they stopped swarming the library and somebody figured out where we were and, um, and a wave of them. Yeah. At least 30 of them. I, I don't know if it, how many more than that started yelling and coming our direction and um I, I it was terrifying to me honestly um and i've been out at a lot of these but um I, i'd love lear to talk a little bit about the dehumanization efforts um i've seen it in real life you go out and they 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 usually start by yelling a little bit, yelling a little bit, yelling a little bit. It takes a while for people to amp themselves up into doing physical harm. Right. But these guys, it's like the these people in Portland, they are like, 
either permanently amped up or they've been out circling the library for hours looking for us. But they swarmed and there was no question that they meant to do us harm. Like they brought weapons, they brought frozen cans of unopened cans of soda and started chucking them at our heads. Um, <laughs> and long before we got there. And um, I was holding up a camera to, um, I turned my camera from the speakers back out to try to get some footage of these guys, all in masks, um, all hiding their identities. And somebody just rushed me and grabbed my, my cell phone and started smashing it on the ground. Um, and that's when, um, really, that's when they, they, they swarmed us and started their attack. Um, uh, I got hit by something on the side of my head. I felt a splash in my eyes. I I just figured it was like a soda can hitting me and that it was like soda getting in my face or something like that. I was more concerned at that moment about my cell phone. I whipped out an old cell phone that I had to try to take more pictures. Somebody came from the other side, grabbed that one and got it away. Um, and then at that moment is when I realized that it was um, some kind of chemical um, bear spray or something that had splashed all over my face and um, and I was blinded and I was in, in searing pain. And by that time they had already, they'd gotten to Lier. That, that I looked up and, and whether I got it from the spray or from the can, like a can of it, I looked over and I saw that somebody had a pump sprayer and was spraying spraying chemicals, spraying bear spray or something into the eyes of the women. They brought this. I think it's really important to remember, they didn't know we were gonna be on the street. What were they gonna do? Bear spray everybody in the library? I mean, they brought this is, weapons this is to do torture. this to us. Under, under the yeah. UN it, it, doctrine, this is torture. It's horrible. This is horrible. It, it was the worst I, I, I've I, ever I, I wouldn't say I've never been in that much pain, but it's one of, um, that combination, you know, the combination of pain and fear is is probably one of the worst, you know, one of the worst combinations. You don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what the hell they've just sprayed, right? Is it bear spray or is it acid? Am acid. I going to be permanently blinded? You know, I couldn't see. My eyes are shut. I started running about 20 feet away. They were already in pursuit of um, the other women they they knocked a number of us to the ground. They they knew who Lier was. They knew who Kara was. They they knocked Lier to the ground. They blinded her, and then they started kicking and hitting her. You know, they kick and they'd hit me too. And then they 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 knew exactly who she was, and they just started kicking her. And it was it was truly it was so. What is distressing to me in my life because I live a life relatively violence free, but I do work with violent people. Um, you know, I'm a psychiatric nurse, so I, I work with people who do physically attack us. Um, you know, usually when you run away, when you refuse to confront the violence, um, you know, and in, in nonviolent action, direct action, you know, of course, you know, we could stand there and take the violence, but you can also step away from the violence. What you're not doing, because we are nonviolent, we're not attacking back, but Usually in life, if you step away, you run away from somebody, the violence ends. You know, it's my my experience, right? They've gotten what they wanted. They they did the thing. Um, this is this is this was pursuit. They they ran after us and continued the violence and did you know hitting and kicking. And um, we did call nine one one. I I said please call nine one one and um, and nobody showed up. The cops didn't show up. They 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 would have kept kicking and hitting us as long as, you know, they wanted. We finally did get out of there, but nobody came to help. One passerby did and and he and he tried to help out and he he wasn't on our side. He wouldn't go that far. But he did say, I don't like to see you guys beating up people. Um so you you mentioned Ant Antifa, which is anti fascist. Uh mm -hmm. anti fascists don't attack women. Yeah. Anti-fascist. Actually, I think Lier must may have asked this in a, in a previous interview. Uh, Anti-fascists would attack Exxon, not a group of women talking about violence against men. What what in the world is going on over there? It's unbelievable. Um, I, yeah, I want the left to take a good hard look at itself, which is one of the reasons that we do these actions. Is we really, really want to bring this to light. But this is what's happened to the left. But 
I mean, I don't even have words to describe what how completely insane this whole thing is. But yeah, there's like real evil actors in the world who are frankly destroying our planet and making a lot of money while doing it. Why aren't you out protesting them? Mm-hmm. There are actually bad things happening on this planet, and they they have names and addresses, as you know, has been famously stated before. You tell Philip. Um, we know who the corporations are who are, you know, the, the architects of the apocalypse. Do something about it. Like, there's, and even just on a local level, there's so many horrible things that you could have an impact, you know, to make the world a better place. There's, I can guarantee you there's single moms on your block who need help, you know, like who need a new washing machine or need their ro- leaky roof fixed or, you know, old people who need firewood. Like there's a million and a half things you could be doing just to help. Uh, and, and they don't do that. What they want to do is um, hurt women because they think it's fun. I have it's just in very blunt terms. That's what that was. They enjoyed hurting us. They came to hurt us. They intended to hurt us and they hurt us. And somehow the left has decided that this is a, a righteous thing, that they are, quote, on the right side of history. And we are 10 mostly middle aged women very peacefully standing on a corner trying to talk about male violence. And men came and did violence to us. And if this is what the left has become, I, well, there's no hope for this planet. So I want people on the left to take a good, hard look at who these people are and why anybody would support them. But this is what they think is changing the world for the better. Um, yeah, I, it, as like Melinda said, it was, it was, I've never experienced physical pain. I've been in a lot of pain for a lot of reasons, but this was a whole other level. I it was nearly vomiting from the pain. It was, you, you can't see. You can't move. I, I was just curled up in a ball with my hands over my eyes, like, and they just kept hitting me. So it, yeah. it was a, it's just, it was torture. I mean, we were tortured on that street. Um, and, and again, they were going to go to the library and do this. So they were going to render that building unusable for God knows how long. We couldn't breathe. I mean, it, and then afterwards, when we were back at the house, we all took showers, changed our clothes. We still couldn't breathe because we were just exuding whatever that spray was. And then... The car that I, I'm a six hour drive from Portland. I live in Northern California. The car that I drove home in for that six hours, for two weeks afterwards, anybody who got in that car would start coughing within 10 seconds. Like mm-hmm. that's how much of that can. And I had washed my hair, changed my clothes. I was like getting ready to take that car to some kind of like massive industrial, you know, cleaning process. Like we've got to get it out of the upholstery. I don't even know what it is, but like the car is like <laughs> a toxic weapon at this point. It did fade eventually, but. They were going to do that to a public library where yeah. old people live on top of the, the, the top floors of that building. And there's late, you know, women with baby carriages next door in the cafe. This is like a war crime. Is the left honestly behind this? Do we actually think we're making a better world by pepper spraying or whatever, chemically altering a library, a public library? I don't, this was nothing that I could recognize as being any kind of either leftist tactic or leftist cause. So on both you know, levels, this is an utter failure for these people who are claiming to be, quote, anti-fascist. You're going to destroy a library? And, and another thing that I hear, Lear <clears throat> and Melinda, is uh, an escalation of this would be disappearing women, murder. Uh, you know, this is the kind yeah. of stuff that would happen in, you know, well, I've seen it in Latin America talk to people in Latin America that if this had this happened. This is the direction that that's going, exactly what you're de- describing. Their rhetoric online, if you go and look at any of their whatever, Twitter, and it's just constant threats of murder um, against women. And okay, so they want to slice our throats, they want to hang us. Um, it's always shut up turf, you know, with this little character with a gun pointing straight at the, at the viewer. Um, so guns, knives, um, you know, arson, um, like horrendous levels of violence against women. Is, and some of it is just utterly deranged. Like they'll have details of what they plan to do to us. Um, right. So that level of dehumanization has already happened. We are already completely monstered. And so they have this word turf that they use against us. So they either call us Nazis or turfs. And what this means is you're no longer human. We know how this works psychologically. We know how hate speech works. You know, it's like name the oppressed group. There are some very ugly names that... None of us need to repeat, uh, but what it means is, psychologically, you are no longer human, you're in this other category. And that was why they needed that word turf. So the moment they get to call you, 
Well, it stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. But you okay. are a turf lane. Like, you don't have you to serious? be a radical feminist. You just have to know that men produce sperm and women produce the eggs, and you are a turf. Like, just basic facts of reality, you are a turf. Um, yeah. I see. We're a turf. We're all turf. So, and that means they can do anything they want to us because um, they honestly believe that there's, quote, a genocide going on against you know, men with special woman identities. It's not. They're one of the safest, safest demographics in the West as men who claim to be women. They're, they are way more likely to be murderers than to be murdered. Um, so, in fact, it's not even true. Uh, but certainly women like Melinda and I don't want to do harm to anyone. Um, our goal is to keep women safe and to, you know, put reality back in place a little bit so that we can remember that women need a word for ourselves, number one, a category, a legal category for ourselves, number two, and safe spaces, um, so well, that we can participate I mean, in life. And health, we healthcare. had this for a decade. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's things in healthcare that I don't need because yes. I'm not a woman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, yeah. I, I can't, honestly. We I'm have really, different bodies. We need different things. Medications are, are prescribed differently depending on whether you're a man or a woman. They're going to kill somebody right. with this. Um, it's a different level of medication and different kinds of medication are needed if you're depending on whether you're a man or a woman. There's hundreds uh-huh. of ways that women's and, bo- men, women's and men's bodies are different. Um, and there was, there was this famous case that happened a few years ago where this woman who thinks she's a man uh, went to an emergency room and she presented with abdominal pain um, and they didn't realize that she wasn't a man and in fact she was miscarrying. Um, Nobody even knew she was pregnant because she didn't say she was a woman and testosterone will, you take enough testosterone, it does, it will change your body enough that some women can pass as men. It doesn't work the other way. The the saying is testosterone, testosterone adds, estrogen cannot take away. So when you have a male body and you add estrogen to it, you you can't change that basic skeletal, that pattern that's already there. It's not going to change. So you're always going to look like a man. But for women who take testosterone, some of your sexual sex secondary characteristics can change a little bit. So, for instance, the, um, the facial hair. So if you see somebody presenting with a full beard, you just sort of automatically assume they're a man, and that's oh. what happened. And she didn't, she didn't actually tell them the truth about her biological reality because this woman obviously thinks it's true that if you just declare you're a man, you're a man. And so she miscarried, and she could have died from it. Um, they didn't realize what was happening until it was way too late to do anything about it. I don't know how you can be pregnant and pretend you're not a woman, but um, that's the level of insanity that this subculture has produced, that this this identity concept uh, overrides every kind of physical reality. Anyway, you're a turf, I'm a turf, Owen's a turf. Anybody who says no to these people in any way is a turf. So once they've got you monstered, they can then do whatever violence they want to you. And it's Darvo, you know, that concept of Darvo? Um, yeah, so it's a deny... Um, uh, you reverse attack. victim and offender. Divide, yeah, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. So the first thing is you deny that it ever happened. This is like classic abuser um, kind of tactics. It's the abuser handbook. So you right. deny that it's happening. Then you attack the person who's telling the truth about it. And then you reverse it so that you look like the victim. And the uh, person who's actually victimized is now the terrible abuser. And this is what they're doing. They're saying, yeah. oh, there's this trans genocide. There's no such thing. Uh, but we are the people who are doing the terrible harm, and therefore we need to be stopped by any means necessary. And that yeah, includes you know, pepper spraying us, and you know, slashing our that. throats, and hanging us. Fascism. Doing... Yeah, right. That's but the they're the the great anti-fascists. So I, this is again, I really, the left has got to come to terms with this. They have let these people take over everything that we once stood for, and the the ways that we were going to get to this better world. Um, have just been completely abandoned. So I, I'd like to, when I, you know, first became friends with Melinda, I was so happy to meet her and, and her husband, Henry. It was like, because what I call people like us are old growth leftists. Like, we, <laughs> we still have the right values and we understand yeah. how to make yeah. a change. And like, just, it would never be appropriate to use chemicals in a library. You would never put old people at risk. And also when they were assaulting us, they attacked an old woman across the street. They knocked yeah. her nothing yeah. to do with us. They knocked her down and they hit her. And our women yeah. had to go yeah. and protect her and they surrounded her and they had to pick her up off the ground and they got her to safety. Um, they were just attacking a random old woman. They could have killed her. This isn't yeah. a joke. Yeah. It's one of the number one causes of old people dying is breaking a hip. Breaking a hip. Yeah. Like they, yeah. Could have, they could have broken her bones. She's a little old yeah. lady. Yeah. 
Uh, in what world is the left on the side of hurting old people on the street, just random old people? This is what they're arguing for. Like, we're not making, this is their behavior. They stand by this. They think they had a great victory when they hurt us like this. This is the tactics they want everybody to be using. And I want the left to understand this. We've got to take a stand. Whether you agree yeah. with us about yeah. the transgender issue or not, is this really? These are the people who are, these people speak for you. This is what you want to see happening on the streets of America. There's been some successes. Yeah. I see that uh, there are some legal briefs, briefs quoting the work that you all have been doing. Can you talk about yeah. that? And then I want to talk about the UN. You have an action at the UN and in May. I'd, li I'd like to see this go to the Supreme Court, this kind of it's thing. It's going. It's going. Can, it's going to get can there. you talk about this? Yeah. Yeah. So my group is Wolf. It's the Women's Liberation Front. And we have um, filed a number of briefs, many briefs over the last maybe five years. Uh, and I really highly encourage everybody to go to our website and read our briefs because they are beautiful, clear, sparkling, amazing, like clarion calls back to basic feminism. Um, our lawyer is a woman named Lauren Bone, and she is just, it's like radical feminism, just the pure beautiful bones of radical feminism in these briefs, just laying out why we need feminism, um, that women are real people, and these are the things we need to be able to participate in civic life. And they're just beautiful documents, so go read them. And one of our moments last year that uh, was, to me, in a, one of the the highlights of my life, and I'm not exaggerating, we had the, the judges in the Ninth Circuit Court. So the Ninth Circuit is the, the court that uh, it, it surrounds San Francisco. So it's the wokest of the woke. It's the most liberal of the liberal, the Ninth Circuit. You never think you can get any services for the Ninth Circuit. And that judge quoted our lawyer in our brief. So they don't even have to read the amicus brief. All they have to do is listen to the, you know, both sides of the argument and hundreds of groups, you know, you're, anyone's allowed to file a brief. Um, and hundreds of groups often do in these big cases that they think are important. And the judges, they're under no obligation to read those briefs. He read our brief. He read every word of it. And he quoted it because ours was so, just so common sense and so obvious um, that, yes, this, this argument that this, this you know, transgender quote movement is making is completely regressive. It's all just the worst kinds of sexual stereotypes about women. They are holding that up as this is what it means to be a woman, whereas real women over here are saying, no, this is everything we've been fighting for the centuries to, to become full humans in our societies. And he got that, and he quoted our brief saying that. And I just have never been so proud of like my movement and my people and, and my organization that we got that done. So that stands now in the law, um, and we helped make that happen. So this is going to hit the Supreme Court eventually. There's any number of cases now that are rolling down that pipeline. It is very slow. Making change through the legal process is a very slow, you have to be in it for the long haul, but we are going to get there. There are going to be cases, and I don't know whether it's going to be a medical detransitioner. I don't know if it's going to be one of the sports cases. Like, there's so many different cases now that are being heard or heard around the country, that, and, and one of them is eventually going to hit the Supreme Court. So time will tell. You know, keep your fingers crossed. But please, everybody, go to Women's Liberation Front. Let's go to our website and, and look at all the legal cases that we have. We need your support. God knows we always need money. <laughs> Any way you want to get involved, please do it. But read our briefs because they're beautiful and you will understand this issue. If, if you don't yet, read the brief and you'll see because it's just it's laid out so clearly. I think it's important to say that part of um, the WDI USA, one of the, uh, so we have a declaration on women's sex-based rights and it was, it was meant in part to um, to counteract um, a tendency among the um, the division of the United Nations, the UN Women. Um, over the last decade, they have they used to be so strong on sex-based rights for women, but their uh, language started changing, and instead of talking about sex, they began talking about uh, gender. So part of why we thought it was important to go to the UN on Mother's Day was. Uh, to read portions of our um, Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights to and call on the UN to start restart making the distinction between uh, sex and gender because part you know the you know I, I think we we get a little bit into the weeds here but it's so important that we fight this on all fronts because once you start losing language and you start 
um, you start not talking about sex-based rights, but gender-based rights, even though there's lots of polling that shows most people still think they're synonymous, um, um, that we get into obfuscation at that point and we and we start, you know, and people start saying, well, you know, it, this is gender based violence, you know, instead of sex based violence. And then um, and and then the laws uh, start to be changed to where, you know, um, again, now we've already seen that in the in North America, there's there are no or almost no women battered women shelters that don't allow men in. I mean, men. They, they allow, if a male shows up and says, I'm a battered woman too, they have to allow him in. So once we start, because my gender is woman, because they've made that split, even though it doesn't matter that most of us aren't there and haven't made that split, they've made that split. So um, that was the kind of point of going to the UN, which I, um, which we were pleased by. And we were also s pleased and surprised that we had, we did have some, some counter protesters, some protesters show up um, they, they, to their credit, were not uh, as violent as the guys in Portland or the the frothing mob in San Francisco. That they, were it not for the police setting up a barrier, probably would have done a lot of violence to us too. Also, Philadelphia, Lear got hit by something in the head in Philadelphia. They like to throw stuff at our heads. That's just kind of that's the beginning of the the cycle. Also, the police showed up there to intervene another time when, you know, when women would have been literally beaten if it wasn't for, you know, the cops erecting a barrier and deciding they didn't want that happening. I want to thank you so much. I've been speaking with Melinda Hughes, longtime activist, Lear Key, Lears of the Deep Green Resistance and a recent book, Bright Green Lies by Monkfish. I recommend that book, by the way. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.